Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stigma Free Society's Facebook Live event. My name is Jerry Friesen, also known as a recovering farmer. I am a stress and conflict management specialist working out of Manitoba. Because of my own journey with mental illness, I have a real passion in talking about it because it is in talking with others we can find a path forward for ourselves. You can learn more about me by visiting jerryfriesen.ca. Through this Facebook Live event, I am representing the Stigma Free Society, which is a Canadian registered charity that aims to reduce stigma of all kinds with a focus on mental health. This event is part of their Rural Mental Wellness Toolkit, an online community-based mental health program that creates access to mental health education and peer support training, as well as practical and relatable resources for those living in rural and agricultural communities. You can find the toolkit at ruralmentalwellness.com, and I'll repeat that again at the end. I'm excited today to have the opportunity opportunity to talk with Lise McMillan. Hi, Lise. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for well, having me here. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. We were going to do this some time ago, and because of illness, we couldn't. And today, I was wondering if we'd have to cancel because of tech issues. But <laughs> thankfully, here we are, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you. As am I. Just a quick bio on Lise. Uh, Lise McMillan is a marriage and family therapist living and working in Steinbach, Manitoba. She is the owner and director of Roca Family Therapy, a private practice that offers therapy and counseling services to individuals, couples, and families. Lise is a graduate of the University of Winnipeg Masters, or Marriage and Family Therapy Program, and she also holds a Bachelor of Arts Honors degree in dance. Her work is trauma-informed, collaborative, and creative with a focus on the emotions and how we engage with ourselves and the people in our lives. As a co-founding uh, uh, co-founder of the Manitoba Farmer Wellness Program, I'm also excited to tell everybody that Lise is one of four counselors we we have. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet Lise and interview Lise for that position, and found it really intriguing how she went from from dance uh, to being a therapist, and then also dealing with, with certainly with the, our agricultural community. So again, looking forward to, to chatting with you, Lise. Mm -hmm. Can we start off by you telling uh, our audience how and why you got into the field of marriage and family therapy? Yes. Um, well, I guess I can be honest and say that I didn't even know the field existed for many years. Uh, I was pretty steadfast in my um, progression to being a professional dancer. And so I moved from uh, the Fraser Valley of BC to do my, uh, my degree in dance. And then I was also at the same time doing um, a degree in psychology. I always had that interest. I grew up with a mom who is a psych nurse, psychiatric nurse. And so mental health has been uh, always discussed in my house, always a part of my life. Uh, so I was always interested, but I got swept up uh, and hired into a dance company and had a full, full career in um, performing and choreography. And then you have to start thinking about the toll it takes on the body and having another career and, um, just the, the transition as we age. Uh, so I then applied for the marriage and family therapy program and uh, luckily got in and then got swept up into this field of work that I'm, I'm now, I would say, equally passionate about. And I think for a lot of artists, we, we can worry about if our career after the arts or our, our parallel career to the arts is something that we're uh, equally passionate about right. and I, I've definitely fallen into that definitely I uh, just kind of swept up in, in the work of um, of counseling and therapy yeah and and you work and when when you talk about uh, coming from the Fraser Valley in BC of course stigma free society is based out of BC mm -hmm. uh, you now find yourself in Steinbach Manitoba that's 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 an interesting route you've taken but actually, it's oddly, uh, oddly kind of circular. Like I've come back to my roots in some ways because my 
parents are originally Manitoban. My dad grew up a uh, farm family in uh, near Portage the Prairie. And my mom, also farm family um, for, for many years, not all her years, but in uh, her dad farmed in Piney, Manitoba and is from St. Pierre. And I ended up meeting uh, a, a guy from Steinbach, Manitoba. So I've come right back to to the family roots in a way. Oh, that's cool. So mm -hmm. what I, what I find interesting is, and and I know due to confidentiality, of course, there are certain things you can't talk about. But mm -hmm. but certainly Steinbach started out as a as a, dare I say um, a Mennonite farming community. It has since obviously grown into a small city. Um, so you have your practice there. Can you talk a little bit about what you do in your practice and the population that you talk to? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I find it hard to consider Steinbach uh, like a rural community nowadays. I would say kind of much like Abbotsford where I grew up, it's this community that is surrounded by agriculture and it's not it's not quite like it's not city, it's not country. It's kind of straddling these these two uh, ways of life, um, and definitely heavily impacted by the agricultural commun community that surrounds it. And so, the communities that I serve here, yeah, I would say it's all over the map. It's uh, I get a lot of people that come to me from the the places around Steinbach that have to uh, drive in for services. Like, so they've, you know, access to service is a question uh, for a lot of people. How do we get to services? There's none in my community. And so they, Steinbach is a central point for a lot of people. Um, and the ages that I work with are ages four up, to be honest. I've, I've had, um, yeah, ages four to about, early 80s come into my office and the the things that we talk about and work on um oddly kind of filter down to the same thing it's often about people feeling um feeling like they are being valued and understood and recognized for their capabilities um feeling a, a connection to the, the people in their life or the work that they do or the um, uh, their purpose in life. So just feeling comfortable with who they are and who they've become. Yeah. And, and that ends up being important to all ages, all people, farmers, non-farmers. Yeah, it's interesting. And when I compare my own journey and I... The lots of people I've talked to through the years, of course, lots of them farmers, but also others, how though we come from certain a certain sector, perhaps, or a certain career, really, at the end of the day, a lot of the issues that we deal with are similar across the board, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They can just have different, different stressors, I would say. Um, like the idea of belonging in a family and the role we play in a family that's important for, for all of us. We're all born into families and have to negotiate these, these, these boxes that we're put in, these roles that we play in the family. But the difference is how things stress that. Um, so for farm families, there's, there's some of the obvious. Their, their coworkers are their family members. So the roles you play at home with siblings can also be played out in work. And so it, things get stressed differently, but it all kind of boils down to the same uh, root issues. Yeah. So Lise, mm -hmm. again, when, when I talk to people and I challenge people that, that they should reach out and find someone that they can talk to, very often I'm asked the question, well, if I go to therapy, what can I expect? What, what do I need to prepare for? Can you tell our audience kind of what that process looks like and what, what people should expect when they first come and see you or contact you? Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, such a good question to ask because I think a lot of people that is uh, maybe what stops them from reaching out uh, is that 
like the fear of the unknown. How is this going to go? Uh, and so what you can expect is that we, we figure it out together from the start. Uh, someone will call me and reach out to me. And then uh, we start creating an alliance together. We start building a relationship, building trust together and say, okay, well, how, how is this going to be comfortable for you? Usually the first question is, do you want to come in person? Yeah. Some people are like, I need to, I need to do this work face-to-face uh, -face in office. Okay, great. Let's set up that appointment. Some people, uh, they're not quite ready for that. They're like, hey, can we do video? Can we do, okay. Yeah, let's test that out and we'll talk if things change and you do want to come in person. And so we just um, create the space where they feel safe asking questions and I provide the guidance and some, some um, structure and that would be like, okay, uh, now we can book an appointment, uh, come on in. Uh, first, we're gonna do a little bit of paperwork. The first session, there's always a bit of signing, some confidentiality, some informed consent. We answer any questions they might have about confidentiality and how that works, what they can and can't say. Um, and, then, and then we get talking and it, it kind of flows quite, yeah quite easily once once people are in the position and someone asks them the questions it kind of it, it just sort of happens much like this conversation we're having today you know? yeah absolutely lisa it makes perfect sense to me and again i know from my own experience it's just how how very quickly you can gain with someone with your experience with your the work you do just gain that level of comfort to be able to to start talking right and and that's the important piece yeah. Yeah. And that there's no bad questions. Um, and so you just open up the floor to, to creating that, that non-judgment and people can come as they are to session and we can create sessions to be what someone needs. Uh, there's all, all ways of doing therapy. It doesn't have to be the same for everyone. Right. We're, we're all different and we all have different experiences. So your approach, I'm sure, differs from person to person. But but mm -hmm. again, and, and this is something I really like to emphasize because I do it with people I talk to is, is just gaining that level of comfort with the therapist that you're working with. Yeah, there's actual a lot of the research shows that the the biggest predictor of change or the most amount of change in therapy actually comes from feeling like you're in a good fit with your therapist. Yeah. Like, so those, the non-tangible things, you know, that, that, like that X factor of like, oh, for whatever reason that I can't exactly say, I just feel like I can trust my therapist and they trust me and we are able to work together. Yeah. And that is actually the, the most influential factor in, in someone's progress towards their goals. Yeah. Perfect. How, do, how does working in a rural community in Manitoba, and I'm sure it's probably would be similar in other agricultural provinces as well, but how does working in a rural community in Manitoba impact the kind of mental health challenges you support? Mm. Yeah, I've actually, I, I read that question. I tried to prepare for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was hoping you wouldn't ask me, well, what are you actually asking me? Because when I just read it now, again, I'm not sure what the, well, you know. Yeah, well, I think, I think for people in this region, there's, there's barriers that they have to overcome to get into therapy. Um, and those barriers impact some of the work that we do as well. Um, and so the topics that we talk and discuss and process in session um, are often things that help normalize um, mental health. Yeah. Uh, saying, you know, it's a, it's okay that you're experiencing all these emotions. It's okay that you have emotions. We all have them. 
Um, and so I don't think that Manitobans are that different from British Columbians or, or even city from country. I think that the problems are often very similar, kind of like we said earlier. The problems can be actually quite similar, but the things that stress the problems are different. And so for rural Manitoba, I think the, the driving distance to get to sessions, um, the, uh, the weather, the winter season, uh, it makes it uh, sometimes a barrier to access some therapy. Um, but once people come in, once they're in my office, there's no, I haven't noticed a huge difference between my work with uh, rural community to to city community. Yeah. But but there are, as we all know, there are unique challenges um, in rural communities. You kind of mentioned yeah. some of them. Do, do you still find that a lot of clients perhaps feel that, you know, they're experiencing something and it doesn't seem like anybody else around them is like, it feels like they're alone in the, in, in the situation they're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's where there's a lot more work to, to normalize it and make it okay that they are experiencing those things. Um, and it makes sense that they're feeling like they might be alone in experiencing it because, um, in rural communities, there, there's often less exposure to other people who are experiencing the same thing. Um, and there's not as much discussion about it. So that's where, I, yeah, the, the stigma is, I think, definitely much more present in the, the rural communities. Um, and that is part of all of our, our work because the, the stigma about it changes the way we talk about our experience of mental health. And so that's present in, in every session. We have to and work you brought, you brought up the word stigma. I have to ask the question, Lise. Yeah. Do you, do you see that stigma reducing? I do very much. I, I mean, through my work with the, the Manitoba Farmer Wellness Program, I have found, I'm working with all ages of farmers and farm families. Um, and I think that even if we do nothing, even if we do no more work in, in advocacy, it's changing, it's already changing because the younger generation who is now stepping into the roles of farming um, and taking over some family farms, they think differently. They're, they're already, looking at well things like TikTok videos they're they're on social media they're seeing many more people exposing their vulnerabilities and talking about mental health and so it's influencing them and the, a common theme that is coming up in my work um, with farm families is the uh, the exploring how they were raised how they were taught to farm and how they can do it different, what values they want to teach through their farming to the next generation. And so building that awareness of how to do things different and what needs to be done differently to create space for mental health. Yeah, and, and a lot of the farm families that I've dealt with in my mediation work over the years, that, that what you just outlined is such a, such a huge dare I say problem because because that younger generation is different and and I've sometimes said and my kids kind of give me a strange look when I say this is I'm thankful that I didn't have a business that I that we I needed to transition over to them because the way they deal with things are so much different than I do and in, in the in the work ethic and I'm not saying this in a bad way at all but the work ethic is different Mm -hmm. um, they have different priorities, and I think those priorities are much, much better suited to a better lifestyle than than the lifestyle I had when I was farming, and the lifestyle my parents had when they were farming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this like this idea that I often have to 
instill into the work with clients is that sometimes less is more and sometimes uh, working less hard is actually having long-term results, is actually having more efficiency. It's actually creating more space for us to feel more whole or more balanced in our day-to-day -day life. That can create healthier relationships too in the workplace and in our families. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that you mentioned, and I think it's important to reiterate that, is that and and I, I have to be careful when I say this, when I talk about the younger generation, I'm talking, I'm not talking about you and the younger generation, I'm talking about me and, and the younger generations. But the point yeah. being is that my kids who are in their 30s are much more open to talking about their mental wellness, their mental health and, and wanting to be more proactive in dealing with that. Is that a, is that a correct assumption to make? Yes. Now, I I tend to look three generations back. Um, I look at intergenerational patterns and intergenerational trauma. And, and so when you say that, Jerry, I'm hearing that you potentially did something a little bit different than your parents did with you. You created a space where your children are able to talk about mental health at home. They are able to have it be part of normal conversation. You're allowing that to happen as a parent. And that may, or I don't know, right? That may or may not be what was uh, allowed for you growing up. And so every generation is passing on a kind of a new, um, it's evolving their, their values or their work ethic as a family. Yeah. And so what we're seeing in, in the younger generation, those, uh, mid twenties to to mid thirties, we're seeing the effects of these other generations taking little steps closer and closer towards having that that balance or that um, place for mental health in family life and in work life and farm life. I w I I'm getting tired of talking about COVID. But I, I'm going to ask the question, how, how did you see COVID impact the clients you have, the community you live in? I would say that I noticed it actually impact the, the farm families a little bit later than the, than the more suburban or the more city families. Um, and I think part of that is the the benefit of farm families working outside. Uh, bubbles being able to be somewhat smaller. Um, and I think that COVID brought huge benefits to rural communities uh, around mental health because suddenly we had all these virtual options. Suddenly therapists had to expand how we work and work virtually for some of us for the first time. And so all these platforms were created to allow that. And then internet had to expand, right? Because everyone needed strong internet connection. Um, and so I think that it, it just opened up the space for a lot more rural communities. Um, to access some some form of care and support, and we're seeing the, the benefit of that now. Uh, and then, uh, in other, I mean, lots of cancellations, right? Having to be really accommodating, people taking stock and taking inventory. How do I feel today? What symptoms do I have today? Uh, building that body awareness of, you know what? I do have a runny nose. Oh. And when I pay attention to that, my throat kind of hurts. Oh, and when I notice that, oh, my body is kind of achy. If I put all those pieces together, I have symptoms and, you know, maybe I do need to take care of myself. Maybe I do need to, you know, cancel a session. And so as much as it's hard, you know, to have all the cancellations, it's everything that I want my clients to do is to, to have that awareness of what's going on in their body and making choices for themselves to, to listen to it and, and react in a way that is for their health. 
So that's one of my, another perk that I'm seeing from COVID is that people now have this awareness of them, uh, a little bit more connection to their body and how that can impact the people around them and impact community. Yeah. Awareness. And if we, if we, if we, if we learn to be more physically aware, um, perhaps that's that one step closer to being mentally aware as well. And when I say mentally, I mean physical health and of course the mental health. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all connected. It's, it's all connected. So, and we've chatted about some of these, but if we can kind of maybe even remind folks of the ones we talked about, perhaps there's some other ones. What are the barriers you see out there for people um, perhaps wanting therapy, perhaps needing therapy? Mm -hmm. um, what are the barriers you see? Uh, knowing where to look. Knowing where and how uh, you can access support. Uh, a lot of people have no idea what the, the difference is, you know, between a, a counselor, a therapist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and it's a bit overwhelming. And so they just don't, don't look. Um, and then we've already kind of mentioned some of the other, other uh, barriers, such as like distance, um, access to support just because of living rurally. Uh, so I think the way to the antidote to all that is to feel okay, feel okay just asking a question, feeling okay knowing that they can reach out to a resource and say no if they're not ready. They can turn it down. They're in control. My clients are always in control of their um, how they choose to access yeah. the, the care. And so reaching out asking a question and just starting from there. Yeah. And, and we had mentioned the stigma piece before and, and thankfully that's reducing, but, but people, and I, I often say to people, you are not alone. And that's a very, very clear message that everybody needs to know that there's mm -hmm. others that are feeling the same. Um, mm -hmm. how, how about, and one of the things of course, that, that we work really hard with in the farmer wellness program is the whole ability to have some flexibility, um, make sure there aren't long wait times, make sure that there's a direct connection between the therapist and the client, not a third or fourth, you know, party to go through to do anything. Is that something that's helpful when people can just make that direct contact with you and, and just set something up instead of going through, you know, some of the employment, uh, EAP programs, uh, you know, where, where you go through a third party, that type of thing. So mm -hmm. comment on that. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of rural people are used to face to face contact you know, like talking directly to the business owner or talking directly to, you know, the neighbor, like whatever it is. And so, uh, I mean, my practice is set up that way. When someone reaches out, they are contacting me directly. I'm the one that answers so that, that connection, that relationship between therapist and, and client or person to person starts immediately. Um, for, for Manitoba Farmer Wellness, it's set up to facilitate exactly that process. So there's no, um, there's no middleman. It, the people can look at the four options for, for therapists. So if you, you look at the, the pictures, read the bios, you see who, for whatever reason, you're drawn to. You don't even have to know why. It doesn't even have to make sense. Uh, and you contact one of us directly. And so everything is, is extremely confidential. No one has to know that you're reaching out. It's, it's just between you and the therapist, if that's how you need it to be. Yeah. All right. Well, Lise, I told you at the outset, half an hour goes by real quickly. Um, yeah. We are getting close, but there's just, and again, we talked about some of this, but perhaps if we can just briefly list it again, what tips do you have for members of our audience who might be struggling right now? Mm. Well, I would first say it's okay. It's okay that you're struggling. And if you're recognizing that you're struggling, that's huge. That's a huge first step that it's okay to take another step from there uh, in any direction. You just 
start once you build that that resilience to acknowledge that you are you're struggling and that you want to do something about it then you'll keep taking steps and advocating for yourself yeah. and then I, I think the other thing i would say is um i uh i asked a client actually the day before i was supposed to do this interview a month ago i asked a client what what would you want to say to other farm other farm families other farmers about accessing care and accessing support and this this wise man probably in his 50s said it's just always worth it when you're out in the field and you feel like oh man i got to get in the car and drive an hour to this this therapy session and drive back home and like there's so much i need to be doing out there in the field or like this tractor needs repair and like all that um but he said it's just always worth it you leave the office and it somehow makes going back into the field the next day easier and so it to tie it into the struggling piece if someone is struggling out there it's okay that you're struggling it's okay to to ask a question about it and to talk about it and it just might make it easier to deal with the struggling the next day you know and 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 again i i do this perhaps too often but a number of years ago when i was struggling and and a colleague and friend of mine just said to me you know what you need to reach out you need to you make an appointment and and i had had appointments before that but i finally i did and an hour after i had done that i went back to this colleague and i said you know what I, I took that step, made the appointment, and I'm already feeling so much better that I'm not sure I need the appointment. You know, it's, <laughs> it's these it's these small little fears we have. And, and so very often just making that appointment is something that creates a lot of anxiety in us. But but I'm I'm telling you, and you're you're saying the same thing, just if you do take that first step, it's already such a big relief that that you've taken that first step towards towards getting better. Mm -hmm. And then if you meet with a therapist, if you meet with a counselor, a social worker, whoever it is, and it doesn't feel good, that's okay too. Try someone else. You keep advocating for your needs. Not yeah. every therapist is going to be the right fit. So you can, there are other, other options. Keep trying. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, I sometimes say it's good to get a second opinion, and sometimes we even need a third or fourth opinion to, to get that level of comfort. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Lise, for joining us today. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Your insights into mental health and wellness certainly have resonated with me, as I'm sure they have with our audience. Uh, the message is clear. It's okay uh, to have challenges. It's okay to be different. And it's okay to need help. And as I know, and as you know, Lise, and a lot of your clients know, we know that there is hope and there is relief. Mm -hmm. If you're struggling today, make sure you reach out and in quotation marks, talk about it. And also, please avail yourself of the many resources available in the Rural Mental Wellness Toolkit which can be found at ruralmentalwellness.com. So till next time, everybody, stay safe and stay well. And thanks again, Lise. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs>